Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or so for you all to come in, and then we'll get started with today's webinar. Okay, I believe the number of attendees coming in is starting to slow down, but thrilled to see more than 400 people so far who are actually attending here. And welcome to today's webinar where we're going to be talking about whether there is an alternative to growth, growth, growth. So I'm Liam Bison McGraw. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Social Policy here at the LSE whose research focuses on the political feasibility of climate change and environmental policies. Uh, using a variety of approaches in the major emitters around the world. And this online event is going to be tackling with one of the major questions that we're facing currently, but have been facing for a long time as well, in terms of the limits to economic growth and how we can deal with climate change and environmental degradation from a perspective of moving from traditional growth paradigms towards those that suggest steady state growth or potentially degrowth. So this online event marks the founding anniversary of the Green Party of England and Wales approximately 50 years ago, and is in conjunction with LSE's library's party archive, which is going to display an exhibition on clothing this naked earth, politics and the planet from approximately a couple of weeks ago on to August 2023. So our panelists today are going to be speaking on this topic um, particularly about how the dominant economic model of economic growth uh, is being called into question at these times where we're really seeing more and more the stark effects of climate change and environmental degradation and the increasing number of experts who instead suggest steady state economics or degrowth should in fact be the goal. And so in this context, what is no growth and is it actually a viable way forward when much of the world is hooked on consumption, which has been often fueled by fossil fuels. So I'd like to first introduce our panelists who have joined us here today. And we really have an amazing panel of people who are experts on this topic. And I'm looking forward to hearing all their thoughts on these issues. So first off, I want to introduce Molly Scott Cato, who's an economist, activist, and was Green MEP for the Southwest of England between 2014 and 2020. Molly is currently the Green Party spokesman on finance and economics, and she is the author of several highly regarded books on green economics. Secondly, we have Paul Ekins, who's a professor of resources and environmental policy at UCL and an expert in the field of sustainable economics. A leading member of the Green Party in the 70s and 80s, he went on to set up International NGO Forum for the Future with Sarah Parking and Jonathan Porritt. We're then joined by Caroline Lucas, who is a Green MP for Brighton Pavilion and a former party leader. The winner of numerous political awards, she is a leading advocate of the Green New Deal, which calls for transformative economic change to address inequality and the climate emergency. And then finally, we're joined by Tim Jackson, who is a professor of sustainable development at the University of Surrey and director of the, for the understanding of sustainable prosperity. He's been at the forefront of global debate on sustainability for four, three decades and is the author of Prosperity Without Growth, Foundations for the Economy of Tomorrow. Now, before we get to our panelists, we want to first introduce Jean Lambert from the Green Party Archive Group and a former MEP who will introduce the archive and the anniversary here at the LSE. So, Jean, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Liam. Well, I'm delighted to say that the uh, Green Party Archive is now available at the LSE Library, and we owe a great debt of thanks to LSE for taking that on. And as you heard, just a taster of the contents of that form part of a public exhibition running from now until August this year. This represents the, the archive represents a culmination of a two year project so far between the Green Party Archive Group and the LSE Library. And it was launched to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Green Party in February this year. The archive itself contains thousands of documents. Greens don't throw things away. So newsletters, committee papers, correspondence, photographs, notes relating to events and political developments through becoming the Ecology Party 
and then into the Green Party. So as I say, it starts that it charts the development of the party from a tiny initiative involving a small group of friends setting up in Coventry to becoming a major political force, influencing politics nationally in Europe and beyond. There is, for example, the Global Greens Congress in South Korea in June this year. And also Jonathan Porritt referred to earlier, who's a key figure in the Green Party in the 70s and 80s, has donated his papers to the library as well. So if we look at some of the key themes, well, a taster of the key themes, you can see from this next slide, do my Chris Whitty impersonation, please, um, that it's the one before that, thank you. Um, you can see in the archive a lot of the things which demonstrate the party's leadership on the climate crisis, renewable energy, water quality, biodiversity, the need to invest in public transport, public services, and many other key issues over the decades. A real green transition long before it became European Union policy. In the next slide, you can see a, a, from the, the article from The Guardian, which relates very much to tonight's topic. And this, as you can see, dates from 1973. And it's been clear from the very outset that we have never been a single issue party, unless, of course, you argue that the safe survival of the planet is the issue. We've always encompassed a full breadth of policies, including a strong social dimension. And opposition to economic growth as a driving political dogma was one of the main planks from the outset as picked up in this article. And one of the things it says is that the choice, according to people, as we were then called, was between planning a transition to living within our means now or letting the energy and food crisis close all our options. In the next slide, another of the themes that's picked up in the exhibition, um, and don't look at the typing, my typing was rubbish, it still is, looks at the frustrations of having to deal with first past the post at national and European level. One of the most striking examples of this was in the 1989 European parliamentary elections, where we won 15% of the vote, but no seats. But it was a vote that made headlines and certainly impacted on the Thatcher government of the day, and indeed British politics in general. People could see that there was competition for a green vote. So if you want further information, this next slide will tell you where to go for that. But overall, the archive shows how far we've come in 50 years, but there's much more to do. We had a great launch event pictured here a couple of weeks ago in the um, restricted premises for those who know the library, 35 people, that's it. At one time that might've held the Green Party, but not these days. So there, two weeks ago, they had this launch of the archive, co-hosted with LSE, attended by surviving co-founders, some of the activists from the early days, such as myself, and current leading Greens. And we're planning activities and events over the coming months for members, supporters, friends, allies in the wider Green movement, and those who are interested in what is happening in Green politics now. So if you go to the website there, 50 years at greenparty.org.uk, you can find out more and sign up for regular updates. But that's enough for the advertisement from me. And now onto the main event of the evening. So I'll hand you back to the chair, Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean, for a wonderful introduction. And I got a sneak peek of the exhibition myself, and it's really a fascinating look into the history of such an important party within this country. So now we're going to move on to the big bulk of the panel discussion. And we're going to start off with each speaker giving uh, approximately five minutes to state their views and their beliefs about the issue at hand, which is that of growth and climatic change. And so first off, I would like to hand the floor over to Molly Scott Cato, who is now going to talk on this issue. Molly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Liam. I think we can all see by observing what's happening in our political discussions at the moment that 
growth has never been more of a dominant mantra within our politics. So we've got the two parties effectively vying over who's going to be more effective at delivering growth. And yet we can see the cognitive dissonance between that and the fact that they're all also saying that they're going to lead on green issues and on climate protection issues. And they don't seem to see the conflict between those two. And I think the 560 odd people on this call tonight probably do see that. And the question is, how do we communicate that better? Because as we saw from the archive, we've been saying that for 50 years. We're obviously doing something wrong in that that message isn't getting heard. So let's try and resolve that as we go through the evening. I think part of the reason growth seems so appealing is that we look around this country and we see that the infrastructure is in chaos and our public services are failing us in a desperate way at the moment and businesses are exploiting their workers. And the two main parties, and I very much draw attention to Jean's point about part of the problem being that there are only two parties that can hold power in this country under our system. Those two main parties are both arguing that the solution to these problems is economic growth. And actually that's growth measured by GDP. But all that is, is an indication of economic output. It doesn't indicate anything about what the economic activity actually achieves, what, what is actually happening when you're measuring that economic activity or indeed the damage that it might do. So when a parent goes out to work, instead of looking after their own child, you get a double boost to growth as measured by GDP because you get the, the childcare worker and the extra economic output from the nursery and you get the economic output from the, the person who's working. And if they decide not to, not to go out to work but to look out after their own children, the economy shrinks twice because the nursery will be smaller and one parent wouldn't be contributing anything in terms of economic output. But that, as well as many other examples I could give, doesn't actually tell you anything at all about the well-being of the parents, the child or indeed the person working in the nursery. So environmental disasters, weekend flights to Amsterdam for leisure activities and an increase in the amount of online gambling, all of these boost GDP. Meanwhile, the delightful Fridays I spend with my grandson do not feature in GDP, although they do enable my son to go to work and help me build a relationship with my, my grandson who gives me more inspiration to do green politics every time I see him. Nor do the clothes swap parties you might enjoy with your friends or the vegetables you grow on your allotment. So this is an old argument, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I'm just trying to explain some of the ways in which GDP is not a good measure of whether our economy is successful or not. It also has to be stressed that GDP, even GDP per capita, doesn't actually tell us anything about how this economic product is distributed. We could double the size of the economy, but the extra product, the extra economic output all went to the top 1%. This would make us, in my view, a worse society, not a better one. In fact, if we look at the data, something like this actually happened. There's some interesting research from the Brookings Institution who assess how much of the product made between 2010 and 2020, the additional economic activity, how much of the value of that went to different parts of society. They don't define the rich in terms of 1%, they define the rich in terms of the, the top 2%. But they found that in the USA over that decade, 65% of the additional economic output actually went to the rich, the top 2%. In Germany, interestingly, it was 51% and it was 33% in the UK. So I'm, I'm quite surprised that we're a lower rate. But even so, a third of the, the extra output went to the richest 2% who are already very wealthy and don't need it. So GDP isn't telling you anything about the equality in society or indeed the well-being of the people who do worse in terms of the distribution. So I think from the point of view of a chancellor, you need a measure of what's happening in your economy. You need to know how much stuff's going on in different sectors. You need to know how much tax yield you're going to have because you need to make um, decisions about investment and also about redistribution, which is another key role of the chancellor, obviously. And so I think I'd like to, to pose two key questions. I think it would be good for us to answer during this evening's event. One is, is GDP the right measure? I think we're, we're I mean, I wait to hear from the other panelists, but I think we're pretty clear that GD, we agree that GDP is not a very good measure. This is a pretty well rehearsed argument in green circles. I think it was Herman Daly who said, if you cut down all the virgin forests of the USA and turn them into gambling chips, you know, you'd be ahead in GDP terms. That in itself, to me, summarizes why it's not a good measure. But for those that haven't read it already, the book, If Women Counted, should also be referenced on this International Women's Day. I'm spokesperson, by the way, Liam, not spokesman, just a little 
pointer. I, I think we usually say speaker actually, which is like saying chair, it's easier. Um, so that's one question, is GDP the right way to measure our economy? And the second question is, do we want it to keep on growing? Whether we're thinking about the issue of people working harder and harder to keep that growth machine turning, the pressure of actually having to consume more novel products, I personally find that part quite stressful, perhaps that's just me, or the incursion of the economy into habitats and the, the clear pressure on the biosphere that we're seeing. So that that's, I think the answers to those questions are obvious, others may disagree, but I think the problem that we've got as the economists who are concerned about the, the consequences of GDP growth as the main measure, is what's our alternative? I think we, we haven't been successful in coming up with a viable alternative, and that feels to me long overdue. I don't do the kind of economics where I do modeling and I sit there working out metrics and statistics, but I think we really ought to get a bunch of us into a room and start thinking through what kind of measures are possible now. And actually far more complex measures are possible because of computing power than, than were possible when GDP was first adopted as a measure. So yeah, th those are my kind of, uh, you know, as the first speaker, I thought I'd outline some of the issues I think we'll be covering and hopefully some of the questions that we might be answering during this session, thanks. Excellent, great. Thanks for setting us off on this course, Molly. And now we're moving on to Paula Ekins, who will now add his thoughts on this topic. Yeah, thanks very much, Liam. And thanks, Molly, for uh, some really, really thought provoking thoughts and ideas. Um, I, I want to come at it from a slightly different direction. Um, I want to ask why is there such a strong political consensus in favor of growth in GDP, which Molly um uh, stated um and that to me is because growth in gdp means at least three things it means higher per capita incomes which most people want indeed a large part of the public sector including my university is on strike for for more income um it means higher profits for businesses which business people certainly want and it means higher taxes for government which enables governments to provide more and better public services, which people seem to want. When I look at the newspapers and discussion about social care, about the NHS, about uh, education and schools. So I think this explains the strong constituency in favor of GDP growth. And I'll then, ask, and I don't need to do this in much detail because Molly laid out a lot of the reasons, why there is such criticism of a strong focus on GDP growth. And to me, it's because there are blind spots in the GDP measure. And as I say, Molly gave us some of those. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about inequality. It doesn't tell us anything about unpaid care. And it doesn't tell us very much about the environment. And so improved outcomes in these areas are not automatically delivered by GDP growth. And to me, that's why some people are very critical about GDP growth. And indeed, Molly was saying uh, the proportion of the GDP growth over the last decade or so that has gone to the rich and has therefore increased inequality rather than reduced it. But this is by no means inevitable. This is the result of political choice, political choices that are made by the countries involved, by uh, the UK electing a conservative government for the last 13 years, by uh, the United States electing Republican administrations uh, that favor a certain kind of economic system of a kind of winner takes all variety. And if one had a different set of political choices, I would then ask the question, will the outcomes in these and other policy areas, meaning the outcomes with regard to inequality, unpaid care, and um, the environment, will they be easier or more difficult to deliver in the absence of GDP growth? And for me, there's no question in my mind that they become more difficult to deliver. On inequality, well, it's politically much easier in a growing economy to direct most of the growth to the poor than when you need to take resources from the well-off through higher taxes. We haven't been doing that, but as I say, that's because we've chosen 
politically, or our governments have chosen politically, not to do it, but they could make different choices. And I very much hope that the next government will make different choices. Growth also makes it much easier to build more affordable homes, to give better health and social care at higher wages to those involved in it, uh, especially important when you have an aging population and the demands on health and social care are going up, to give all children free school meals, to provide more free childcare to parents who want to develop their careers. And a very important part of the feminist movement in my reading is that uh, people should have a chance to develop their careers without um, necessarily uh, having uh, onerous parental roles. That leads me to what for me is the most important issue of all, which is the environment. And won't it be damaged by economic growth? And this was the subject of my PhD in a book that I published in 2000. And I started thinking that the answer was yes, it would be. And I finished up thinking that the answer was not necessarily. And this was because protecting and improving the environment will require stronger regulation and more resources for its enforcement. It will also require huge investment to decarbonize our economy and innovation to develop and improve low carbon technologies. Delivering this greater resources for regulation, I was with someone from the Environment Agency the other day and heard how it had been hollowed out in the name of, um, uh, how, uh, because the economy wasn't growing fast enough to deliver those resources. Um, and to get the investment that we need in all the low carbon technologies in order to remake our energy system will be much, much harder in the absence of GDP growth. Without growth, this investment will have to come exclusively from reducing consumption, and this is not likely to be a winning political proposition. In any case, the investment and in innovation to improve the environment will itself generate economic growth. That's what investment and innovation do. And every growth model I've ever seen has investment and innovation in the uh, um, explanatory variables. And Lord Stern, of course, has called decarbonization the growth opportunity of the 21st century. So if we do decarbonization properly, whether or not we want it, we will get economic growth. So there are, of course, alternatives to growth, 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 and they will require more voluntary work if incomes aren't growing and people want to do different things, then they'll have to do it unpaid in their spare time. They'll have less income. Uh, they'll have less paid work. We may get closer communities. Uh, there may be a greater role for carers, such as Molly was talking about, care, people caring for their, caring unpaid for their children or their grandchildren, or doing that in an unpaid community context. With innovation and technical change at the same time, we could take more leisure uh, and have less income. Those are all interesting choices that people might make. I don't see much evidence in the society in which I live that people want those choices. I think they want uh, higher income and the things that go with that. So my conclusion is that we don't need alternatives to GDP growth to deliver reduced inequality and other health and social objectives. We need different political choices directed specifically towards those objectives. And given those political choices, GDP growth will make them easier to deliver. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Paul, for your insights on the question of whether growth itself is the problem or rather the nature of growth as we see it right now and how it's been channeled politically. So moving on to our next panelist, we have Tim Jackson. So Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liam. And thank you to the Green Party. Um, may you live long and prosper. 
it's uh, extraordinary that there is still really only one party that's prepared to take the position that you do take in relation to the question of economic growth. I want to make um, three arguments really why growth, growth, growth won't work, even if some forms of growth might actually make our lives a little bit easier. And, and I'm talking as Molly was, as Paul was about growth, growth, growth in the GDP. I'm talking about the um, what, what almost be called, I think Molly did call a kind of political fetish, a mania with growth as a guiding principle for society. And, and my first argument is, is a very, very, very simple one. If you've got your eyes set on the growth prize, you're missing what's happening elsewhere. You're missing what's happening to well-being in the economy. You're missing what's happening to inequality in the economy. You're missing what's happening to sustainability. And we have seen that over decades. And we see it still now that choices are made in pursuit of the idea that we can somehow increase our rates of growth, um, which pay no attention to the basic inequality, for example, that the measures that are proposed to promote growth would entail. And that's why, for example, the short-lived trust government thought it was okay to cut taxes to its mates in pursuit of something that eventually would grow the economy and would eventually trickle down to the poorest in society if the rich in society allowed the money to trickle that far and that would eventually leave people better off. So that's, a, it's, and, we, and we've seen that too in the way that we approach investment in sustainability for all um, that Paul was talking about, the need for investment there. And I want to come back to that point. Um, the reality is that it's been very hard to get that investment because it competes in financial markets with investments which are seen to promote more in the way of growth. And those are supported by the regulatory framework. And they're also supported by a culture of greed, which seeks financial returns above social and environmental returns. And while growth, growth, growth is our maxim, it's very, very difficult to subvert the force of that power. My second reason builds a little bit on on what Paul was saying and I want to I hope we can have a, a bit more of an in-depth conversation about this because I think it's incredibly important um, if you're focusing instead on the things that matter let's say we're measuring and focusing on well-being we're measuring and focusing on social justice we're measuring and focusing on sustainability and living within planetary limits then there's a kind of an open question about whether or not you get some growth out of that and under what conditions you get growth out of it and this is, to some extent, what Paul was pointing to, an argument that innovation, uh, in conjunction perhaps with some regulation, is actually something that will favour growth in the long run. And I think there are places where that is potentially true if you think about technologies which are resource efficient, which therefore improve profit margins and allow returns both to shareholders and higher wages to workers and in which your long run productivity in the economy increases. But it is also the case that those productivity increases as they increase the rate of growth, increase your needs to decouple, to increase the productivity with which you're using resources and to invest in more investments, which will reduce the impact of that growth on the environment. So you're kind of on running, if you like, in the same place to stay still a little bit like um, Alice through the looking glass. And and, and the, the long run impact of that is difficult to predict. And it's difficult to um, assure ourselves that we can achieve our environment, environmental goals, particularly in the context when that growth is seen as part of a political fetish. More worryingly to me, I think there are incredibly important avenues in the transition to a sustainable society, a net zero society, a nature positive society, in which the nature of those investments is not productivity enhancing in the conventional sense. In other words, it doesn't contribute to economic growth in the sense that Paul wants innovation to do, specifically because it doesn't attract the sorts of financial returns that labor productivity enhancing investments do attract. And this is particularly important when we talk about a sector that both Molly and Paul have talked about, which is the care sector. The care sector is a fascinating sector in society because it resists typically any kind of 
continual pursuit of labor productivity growth. And it's very meaningful that it resists that because time, as Molly can attest from her own example with her grandkid, is the core essence and the value proposition of those activities. The time spent by the carer with the person they are caring for is what provides value. The basis of labor productivity growth, the basis of investments which are innovative and intending to enhance labor productivity growth is quite price precisely to chase that time out of the economy to ask nurses to work longer and longer hours to ask junior doctors to have longer and longer lists to ask teachers to have bigger and bigger class sizes and so on and and that is in itself to undermine value and well-being in society in pursuit of the economic growth measured in terms of the productivity that delivers a rising GDP. So I believe there are places, and social care isn't the only one, you could also talk about ecosystem restoration, where the productivity returns to the economy do not lead to long run growth. And yet they are essential to the kind of society that we want. And so we have to have a political um, objective, a set of political objectives, which allows us to pursue those non-growth based, non-productivity enhancing investments, which are essential to sustainability. And then I just want to touch on one last reason, which is to me, you know, one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years, it's been quite extraordinary is that conventional growth and in particular productivity enhanced growth in the advanced economies has been slowing down. It's almost gone missing. It's missing in action, labor productivity, even before the pandemic in the UK was hovering around 0% growth. And in fact, that growth rate has been declining, not just since the pandemic, not just since the financial crisis, but since the 1960s. The advanced economies are not growing in the way that they thought they would. And the concept of secular stagnation, the departure of growth, even on its own terms, is something that advanced economies now have to take seriously if they are to organize their society. So we might accept and to some extent, I do accept Paul's point that if you had that growth and you used it wisely with the right politics, it might be easier to solve problems of the cutting up and the division of the pie. When you don't have that growth for whatever reason, then you have to solve those problems in a different way. And that, I think, is our challenge. It's the challenge of what I would call a post-growth economics. How does an economy work? How does a society work when, for whatever reason, it doesn't have growth, growth, growth in the way that all of those politicians and all of those conventional economists would like? That is our challenge, it seems to me. And the starting point for it is to understand and to unpack what Molly called a fetish, what others have called a mantra or, a, or a, even, a, even a religion at some points. Why are we so dependent? Why are our institutions so dependent on that growth in the GDP that we are unlikely to be able to sustain into the future? And that is a task which is, of course, incredibly difficult. It's difficult socially, it's difficult politically, it's difficult technically, it's difficult e economically, but it is the task of the day and I see no way around it. Excellent. Thank you, Tim, for your thoughts on the kind of broad sense of post-growth economics, but also how this kind of potential hamster wheel of kind of conventional ways of thinking of economic growth potentially undermines social welfare within society. Now, all of our panelists so far have talked quite a lot about actually politics in this. Uh, so economics is not apolitical. And so at this point, I think, Caroline, it would be great for you to share your thoughts. Thanks very much, uh, Liam. Yes, what I was going to do and what I will still do um, is talk about some of the challenges in terms of getting this whole debate into the political mainstream and how we're trying to do that at Westminster. But um, true to being a politician, I can't quite go straight to the process without just coming in on the substance just for a couple of seconds. And um, just in particular, something that Paul said that had uh, stuck in my head about saying, essentially, I think, I, ho I hope this isn't too unfair a paraphrase, but basically growth isn't too much of a worry, for example, if we do decarbonization properly. And I just wanted to pick up on that because it just feels like it is such a big if, if we do decarbonization properly. And just reflecting on the fact that we know right now, the world is, is, is trying to aspire to net zero by 2050, however, um, late and slow we think that might be. But if during that same period, the global economy is due to nearly 
treble in size, that means three times more production and consumption over the next 30 years. And it means it's hard enough to decarbonize an economy the size of the current one. The idea that we can do that three times over, I just feel is just such a big risk. Maybe we can, but if we can't, then the impacts of that seem to me to be just so serious. And as far as I can see, there's no real evidence that decoupling of production and environmental impact, I've not seen any evidence that that can happen at the speed and the scale and the comprehensiveness. Of course it is happening, but can it happen fast enough and comprehensively enough to mean that we could rest assured on that big if that was in your, in, in what you said there. So that was just a quick substantive point um, before doing what I was asked to do, <laughs> which was talking more about, about the process. And I was just going to echo a little bit about, about what Molly was saying really about how the idea that there is an alternative uh, to growth is still heresy. Um, and it's not limited to the government. I was struck by Keir Starmer's economic missions that he launched uh, the other week. Um, and his, his economic mission wasn't, for example, to close the obscene inequality gap between rich and poor in this country. It was instead to secure the highest sustained growth in the G7. And I just feel it, it is incumbent upon us to ask why for what, um, and to really start saying, you know, growth for what? I think Kate Rayworth had it right when she said, you know, she was the wonderful uh, writer and thinker and economist who, who wrote the wonderful Donut Economics book, but where she was basically saying that what we need are economies that thrive, whether or not they grow, not economies that grow, whether or not they thrive. And it feels like at Westminster right now, we've got exactly the wrong way around on that. But I, I was going to give you a quick snapshot of, of what's happening amongst those of us who, who do want to challenge the, the growth mantra. And to start off by saying a few words about an all party parliamentary group, which does exist on limits to growth. And I must say when Rupert Reid first suggested this to me, and many of you in the audience may well know uh, Rupert, a very well known Green Party member, when he suggested that we get a limits to growth all party group, I said to him, Rupert, an all party group means we need to have a conservative who's going to sign up to limits to growth. That ain't going to happen. But actually it did, in parenthesis, Peter Bottomley, for people who want to know. Um, and so we do technically have an all party group and um, that group uh, is very lucky to have as its secretariat, the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, which basically is, is Tim Jackson and, and his colleagues there at CUSP um, who, who provide a wonderful secretariat for us. We have around 40 members. We've been around since 2016. And essentially our mission is to create the space for cross-party dialogue on environmental and social limits to growth, to assess the evidence for such limits, to identify risks and try to redefine prosperity. And to give you a sense of some of the things we've been doing, well, last year, for example, we held a discussion to mark the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome's influential report on the limits to growth. In the run-up to the 2021 spending review, we were joined by the Guardian senior economics commentator, Aditya Chakraborty. We also had then the UCL's emer emeritus professor, Victoria Chick, who very, very sadly died earlier this year. She was one of the world's leading scholars of Keynes and monetary economics. And they were briefing MPs essentially on debt, on austerity, on reaching our climate goals. And we got parliamentarians thinking about growth dependency in the welfare system that Tim has touched on just now. We introduced them to the latest alternative economic models and metrics to define and measure and deliver sustainable prosperity. We held a masterclass on how to fund a post-pandemic green recovery with US economist Stephanie Kelton, uh, a former member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And I hope at some time uh, this evening, we will talk a little bit about credit creation, given that that is what got us out of the whole of the uh, austerity and the financial crisis to begin with, and then with COVID afterwards. And then we held another session as well on, on the precautionary principle. So what unites all of our work essentially is an attempt to reframe and unpick the issue of growth. We wanna move on from being either for or anti-growth to instead ask about the alternatives, how we can deliver on all of the benefits people cite for growth without the associated damage. And my work to put alternatives to growth on the political agenda predates the APPG and has built on it. So for example, in the period running up to the Glasgow COP, a campaign to get 100,000 signatures on a petition that would have triggered the first ever major debate in parliament on a well-being economy. 
Sadly, we fell just short of that 100,000 signatures, but we still did get the debate. And it was an important moment, I think, where the government did have to come and respond to what we were saying on the issue of the economics of, of growth. Um, and I think that the, the tide is turning a little bit, you know, so the minister did have to come along and say, the government is already taking steps, she said, towards a broader understanding of progress and GDP growth, rather than simply measuring our success in conventional economic terms, we are increasingly focusing on a range of other measures. Frankly, a decade ago, it's almost inconceivable that measures like new guidelines for considering well-being in detail would make it into the Treasury's Green Book, or that the government would be working with the ONS, um, the, the statistics body, to improve the way in which nature is incorporated into our national accounts, which is a, a direct result of the so-called Das Gupta review, which was a review into the economics of the environment. And when I get cross-party MPs to support an amendment to completely scrap the financial services and marketing bill, markets bill, because it's predicted, predicated on promoting growth and competitiveness rather than a well-being economy designed to foster long-term resilience and, and prosperity. Or when the Green Party peer, Natalie Bennett, seeks to replace every mention of economic growth in the UK Infrastructure Bank bill, instead with achieving direct improvements of life outcomes in disadvantaged areas. It is true that we're still swimming against the tide, but I just want to say that those tides are beginning to change. Um, and, and as real tides grow, so does awareness, even in the corridors of, of Westminster. Last week, I wrote to the Chancellor to urge him to make the forthcoming spring budget a turning point towards new measures of economic progress, to suggest that he stands up in the House of Commons um, to say that as well as reporting on the OBR's updated economic and fiscal forecast, he might also like to report on the economic, social, environmental indicators that determine whether or not people can live healthy and fulfilled lives. There are so many alternatives out there. I'm running out of time, but I just want to hope that we can get to talk about, for example, New Zealand, home to the first ever wellbeing budget and a finance ministry that uses the living standards framework to shape all economic policy making. Um, that there are some great alliances out there now that are looking um, at alternatives to growth. And I think we need to, to build on those and make sure that that becomes the mainstream going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much, Caroline, for your thoughts on the matter. Um, as is always the case, 90 minutes, I think we're going to have a hard time covering all of these issues, which are of incredible importance, but hopefully we can get a good chunk of them done in this time. And so for this part of the session now, we're going to switch towards a kind of a bit more of a panel discussion, a little bit of a back and forth between our panelists before opening up to a broader Q&A. Um, and so for the first kind of round of this, we'll just kind of go in the existing speaker order. But I want to kind of situate our kind of starting point here um, more about this dependence of growth and the necessity of growth for the system. So as Paul mentioned, but also Reinhard Huss in the chat, um, a lot of the kind of logic of growth has been that is a way to increase the amount of revenues brought in by governments without necessarily changing too much of the actual tax rates that are involved. And as Emmy Williamson in the chat has also noted, this has very much funded our public services for a long time. And so to one extent is, are we actually kind of hooked on this model of growth such that if we tried to transition away from it, uh, we'd have a hard time funding our existing systems? And then secondly, is the question really about growth itself or is this the wrong type of growth that we're engaging in? So Molly, do you want to respond to this kind of idea first? I think a useful way to start reflecting on this is to go back to the points Paul was making about the relationship between inequality and growth. And obviously it's true that we could decide to share the product of growth, whether through taxation or through distribution in a different way. That is a political decision. But I'm not convinced that that's just about voting. I'm not convinced that's a narrow political decision. I think it's much more cultural than that because essentially, the, the growth dynamic that's driving our economy is the other side of the coin from the sort of greed dynamic that we're encouraged to indulge in as individuals. Um, you know, I think it was Boris Johnson, wasn't it? Why am I citing him? But anyway, he was, he was a big supporter of greed. But I think we are all encouraged to be greedy and to seek novelty and to buy more and to become a beast. And that's, that's us being good citizens effectively. And that is part of the growth dynamic. So it's not as simple as just saying, you know, we could vote for a party that is focus more on 
uh, equality. And as Caroline points out, that's no longer the Labour Party. So in a, in a choice between two parties, that's not very easy to do anyway in our country at the moment. But I think the other really important thing to say is that the focus on more diverts us from that question about the allocation. And effectively, Labour made a wrong choice on that as long ago as Peter Mandelson, who said, you know, we're relaxed about people becoming filthy rich because he didn't want to say to some people, no, you're going to have to pay more taxes to fund public services. So he just said, don't worry, everybody can get richer. And so I, I think it's a bit of an easy way out to say, you know, well, you know, we could carry on growing, but we can decide how we share that the outcomes of that better. And also, of course, you know, people who make that argument really ought to be focused on why we're not getting efficient tax policy at the moment. I mean, I do some work on economic growth. I do a lot more work on tax than I did as an MEP. And tax is, is voluntary if you're, if you're very wealthy. And uh, so, yes, we do, we do need economic activity and we do need to bring in revenue. And any chancellor who denied that would, would uh, end up with problems very rapidly. But, you know, th there's, there's a lot more complexity going on there than just saying, oh, bigger economy, more tax, more public spending. But I also think as Greens, we need to be asking those deeper questions about how our public services should work. And uh, the Greenhouse Think Tank did a, a whole project called the Post Growth Economy a while back. And one of the things we looked at then was how public services might work in a way that was less part of the growth dynamic way of looking at the economy. And we did reach some of the conclusions that Tim was talking about. For example, you know, is it a hardship to say that you might spend time in hospital with your loved ones rather than having an extremely overstressed nurse rushing about looking after them? You know, actually it's quite difficult to get into hospital and, and do some of those personal care services, feeding, feeding your parents as, when they're ill or, or, and so on. You know, is there actually an argument to be made, made that some of those more human approaches to resolving our public service, uh, the, the crisis in our public services might actually be welcomed in a world where we were not so desperately under pressure to work more, to earn more, to fulfill our role in this growth dynamic economy that we're all sort of subject to. Okay, great. Thank you, Molly. So next we'll go to Paul and then Tim afterwards. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, um, uh, in, a, in a way, pivot a bit from the first things I was saying, because uh, while I said and believe that uh, growth uh, can make the achievement of a lot of social objectives uh, easier, um, I think it is true that um, because growth offers those uh, easier options, politicians are tempted to go for growth at all costs. In other words, to make choices that they think will grow the economy, even if they have undesirable social uh, and distributional outcomes. Um, someone mentioned Liz Truss. I mean, that was clearly the kind of growth that she was interested in uh, and that was clearly the kind of growth that she was keen to promote um, and that is not where I am at all and I think uh, where I absolutely share the uh, convictions of what uh, the others have said is that one needs to focus on what one wants to achieve uh, and by focusing on that and I mean reduced inequality, and I mean more uh, social services, etc. cetera, um, uh, it is possible that uh, some of that, that, well, firstly, it will be easier in a growing economy to achieve those things. But secondly, one has to be very careful not to damage those things in one's efforts to increase growth. There's a, uh, a, a very strong line of thought in uh, environmental circles, for example, um, that came out of Michael Porter and, uh, and, and the Harvard Business School, that environmental regulation is actually good for innovation and growth. And that therefore, if you regulate properly, sensibly, uh, you can get businesses uh, to become more innovative, uh, increase their output, et cetera. Now, that's still a very controversial theory, and I know lots of economists who don't agree with it, but it is at least possible. Um, so I think the growth, growth, growth at all costs is clearly 
um, both undesirable, probably what will lead to what Herman Daly called uneconomic growth in the sense that all sorts of social and environmental costs that are left out of that um, uh, become apparent and to a large extent counteract the increased incomes. So I just clarify that. I think um, Keir Starmer was extremely unwise to go for the highest growth in the G7 um, because there will be six other prime ministers or presidents going for the highest growth in the G7 and only one of them can win. So I think politically it was a very unwise thing to say. And because that's now his target, he will be minded to do things he shouldn't do to get growth, which will be damaging socially and environmentally. So uh, that was certainly not something that I thought was sensible. But I think Tim's remarks were really thought provoking and ones that I haven't given enough thought to myself, which is, uh, he's absolutely right about the, uh, the failure of the UK economy to achieve productivity growth over the last 10 to 15 years. All sorts of potential reasons for that, um, but it is a fact of life. And the question that he asks about how do we get a better society, um, however one might want to define that, in the absence of growth, when it is the promise of growth that has that politicians and, and policymakers have relied on to deliver uh, many of the things that people want, how, how do we get that if we don't get economic growth? And how, under those circumstances, do we prevent politicians and policymakers reverting to the growth at all costs um, uh, scenarios, which we're all familiar with, and which uh, we've seen in spades um, over uh, the last few years. Um, so I think that's uh, a question that we need more uh, thought about and we need much more discussion about because at the moment it's barely discussed. And, and uh, the last thing I'll say, not entirely flippantly, looking at um, Molly's EU flag, if, um, if Keir Starmer is really keen to get um, uh, the highest growth in the G7, then he will have absolutely no alternative but to rejoin the single market and the customs union and probably the EU as well. Because the one thing you can, we can be sure of and the one thing we've seen plenty of evidence for in the last uh, two to three years is the way in which business investment has collapsed, the way in which businesses are finding it much more difficult to do things, the impacts on exports, the impacts on labor markets, all sorts of things. So. Um, there we go. That leads me to think that perhaps that's something he will be forced to consider if he really wants to achieve that growth objective. Excellent. Thank you. So next we'll have Tim and then be followed by Caroline. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to unpack a little bit what I was saying at the end of my first intervention, which is this, this call essentially to address growth dependency and to begin to unpack what a post-growth economics might look like and to show not finished results in that respect, but at least a rich area of interrogation and investigation and research that is already ongoing and that can begin to address some of these questions. How do you square the circle of providing social welfare when your tax revenue base is not growing? How do you employ people when uh, the, the economy is not growing? How do you um, reduce inequality when the economy is not going? And, and a couple of years, I just want to give a couple of examples of some of the research that you can do and some of the avenues and policy implications that that has when you address it at that fine grained level, not saying, oh, we haven't got any growth anymore. We can't do all these things, but actually asking what growth dependency is in the finance sector, what growth dependency is in relation to jobs, what growth dependency is in relation to social care. 
And some of the work that you'll find actually on the APPG website, uh, the, the Limits to Growth APPG that Caroline was talking about, addresses some of those specific issues. There's a paper there, for example, on social care. And when you begin to look at growth dependency in social care, you find that, of course, yes, it is driven by demographic changes and demand and needs satisfaction. But underlying that is a model of the financialization of social care that essentially takes public revenues to support private enterprise in an extractivist model, which reduces and represses the wages of carers, reduces the quality of, of care on the people who are being cared for, and takes the profits of that underwritten by property market speculation and puts them in the Cayman Islands. And that is our model of delivering social care under the current economics. It's been that way for a decade and a half. And you cannot address that growth dependency without confronting that structure of the care industry. But when you do begin to look at it, then you can get beyond the growth dependency that's now been built into social care. Inequality is another issue. A few years ago, Thomas Piketty put out a paper which sort of put the rise in inequality, put the blame for the rise in inequality on the decline in the growth rate. And he produced what looked like a you know, fail safe, very clever model to show why that was the case and some, and some nice equations to, that, that showed it. And actually, uh, my collaborator and I, Peter Victor, looked at that equation, looked at those equations, said, yeah, but actually you've got a key assumption in there, which is about the instant substitutability between labor and capital. If you take that assumption away, actually, if you put rights on people working, for example, if you protect labor, if you pre present actually a right to work as a part of a government policy, you reduce the substitutability between labor and capital, you make, you make it possible to have a more labor intensive economy and you reduce inequality at the source. And, and that's the kind of work that I think needs to be done. It hasn't been done everywhere. It hasn't reached policy in the way that it needs to reach policy, but it is a possibility. And it's, a, it's in my view, it is the grown up politics that we need. Let's not talk about growth. Let's just talk about being grown up and ask the adults in the room actually to confront the reality of the situation and to deliver a politics and an economics and a set of policies that protects the things that we want and begins to dismantle what are sometimes completely perverse growth dependencies on which we've rested for the last 50 years. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to this issue about if you regulate properly, I'm sorry, Paul, but, but you did that, say that as, as a second time when, when in, your, in your second intervention you were talking about regulating properly. And maybe it's just that I'm so close to watching what the government is doing and they are so far from regulating properly that it, it feels like quite a hard thing to wrap my head around to think that that's going to be our solution. Um, but but if, it feels to me that if, if growth is always there as the get out of jail free card, then, then some of the harder issues are just never addressed and so for example you know the, the government won't say that um that there should ever be any restriction on people's ability to fly whenever they like as far as they like um you know with whatever environmental cost they like In, instead of looking at some of the obvious policies which would be to put some um caps on airport expansion for example or to introduce a frequent flyer levy which would ratchet up so that, it, so that a flight would cost you more the more often you travel. So you try to build some progressiveness into that. They're not even going to begin to look at that because it doesn't deliver the growth that they think they want. Instead of which we go down the blind alley, as I think it is certainly in the short term, at least of, of, of jet zero of, you know, proposals that we're going to, um, you know, have all kinds of biomass uh, planted instead of actually feeding ourselves, we're going to be once again sort of feeding aeroplane engines and so forth. And even if they can say that each individual flight is going to be responsible for fewer emissions, that is very soon counteracted by the fact that more flights are happening overall so that the total impact is still one of, of massive damage. And I think as well that it stops us talking about some of these other policies that could, could be introduced that would um, that would address inequality um, in, in perhaps a rather more predictable 
way. And I'm thinking of the obvious ones like, you know, why does no one other than the Green Party ever talk about a wealth tax anymore? You know, why why is that such a, um, a, a, a heresy when we tax income, but, but basically wealth is not taxed at all. And yet we know that a, a very modest uh, wealth tax, which the, the Green Party was proposing would bring in around 70 billion. You can do quite a lot with 70 billion. Uh, and that was quite a modest wealth tax. That's before we even look at some of the you know, the windfall taxes that, that are supposed to be on the energy companies, but which have a massive loophole in the middle of them because basically the energy companies can avoid 91 pounds and every 100 pounds that they're meant to be paying in a windfall tax if they reinvest that money into more oil and gas. I mean, you can't even think really of a more perverse policy, whichever way you look at it, whether it's from the money foregone from the treasury or from the devastating impact of, of incentivizing yet more oil and gas. So we could have a higher wealth taxes, we could have more progressive taxation overall, we could have higher corporate taxation if necessary. And we could begin a debate at least, which I wanna pay tribute to, to Mia Motley, the prime minister of Barbados for, for doing, of for example, the IMF special drawing rights and whether or not finances could be used from that to have a massive investment in enabling poorer countries to start to um, build resilience when it comes to the climate emergency that's going to hit them first and hardest, even though they are, as we know, least responsible for it. Or we could begin to have a debate about under what circumstances is it appropriate to create money? And I'm not suggesting there is a magic money tree down the bottom of the garden, but neither do I think we should let governments get away from pretending that the government's balance sheet is like a family's um, budget. You, you, you know, it's, it's simply not true to say that the government only has a fixed amount of money and when it's gone, it's gone. That is certainly true when you're a household because you don't have the capacity to, to, to create money. But other, other governments um, that, that have sovereign currencies certainly can if they choose under certain conditions. And we did it massively, as I, as I said before, when it came to the... Um, the financial crisis in 2008-9 and we did it when it came to to COVID we've we found billions and it feels like if we can do it for COVID and the financial crisis you know why can't we do it for the planet as the famous saying goes you know if the planet were a bank it would have been bailed out years ago so I just think in conclusion that the fetish on growth it just stops us looking at other ways of achieving positive ends which might just be um more effective and, 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 and carry fewer risks with them. Excellent. So we will have a brief point from Molly before we move on to the next topic. Molly? I just wanted to pick up quickly this issue of innovation because we have so much focus on technological innovation, but in my view, the ecological crisis will be resolved and especially the climate crisis by social innovation is much more important than, than technological innovation. And an example of why that doesn't happen, what we call modal shift as Greens, why that doesn't happen is because that would reduce economic growth. So while you're in this paradigm of, of constant growth, you can't make the social changes because they wouldn't require the production of new products. I'll just give one very simple example of this. It's why the Labour Party supports a transition to electric vehicles, whereas the Green Party would support an expansion of public transport. Because if you had public transport, people walking and cycling, you wouldn't be generating economic growth. In fact, economic growth would shrink. But if everybody's just changing their factory from making petrol vehicles to making electric vehicles, actually you've got more economic growth probably because people will throw away their petrol vehicles and buy an electric one. So it's just an example of the way in which to achieve the ecological sustainability that we need. You do have to get away from that focus on growth because otherwise the very policies you need, which are changes in the way we live, would damage your economic record in terms of the way we're measuring it at the moment. Great. So we're now going to move on to another topic that's also partly influenced by some of the questions we're getting in the Q&A. And partly it's related to some of the conception of what is the economic model we're working with. And part of the discussion has been about changing the current economic model or emphasizing different aspects of it to achieve different outcomes. So one way of putting this is there's been this discussion of, well, the current system is not very good at pricing um, things such as care, or it doesn't really capture productivity in the way we would conventionally think of this. 
Um, and also in the Q&A, Dorothy Stein notes that, okay, well, if social costs and benefits were actually priced in by measures of GDP, then would there be less of an issue? Um, and this also ties in with broader discussions about how do we incentivize consumers' behavior, right? So if you had increased taxes, uh, carbon taxes, John in the Q&A talks about this in terms of VAT, would that incentivize individuals to act greener? Um, and so one question here is, is, is there a place for these market-based mechanisms for achieving these goals, um, given that these are kind of the ones that are most compatible with the existing system, or is more fundamental change ultimately required and market-based mechanisms are just rearranging the chairs on the Titanic? So with this, Paul, do you want to start off and we'll go through the same order again? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, um, as anyone who's followed any of my work knows, I've been an advocate of market-based mechanisms for a rather long time, um, carbon taxes and the rest. Um, and indeed, the various taxes that Caroline was talking about, uh, many of them would uh, both give incentives uh, to shift patterns of production and consumption, um, encourage people to spend money on other things rather than environmentally destructive things. Um, and if we were to tax them uh, at a high enough rate would provide significant revenues to uh, enable us to reduce uh, those taxes that actually uh, blunt incentives, uh, taxes on income and taxes on, um, on profits. So the whole eco-tax reform idea is one that uh, I've been very um, close to for a very long time. A, a kind of general point about that, I, I kind of feel in some of the things that both Caroline and, and, and Molly said that they're kind of blaming um, a, a focus on economic growth for the fact that governments don't do the things that they would like. Uh, for example, I, I don't feel that we don't introduce a wealth tax or land value taxation, indeed, which, again, I've also been a, a strong supporter of for many years. And very interesting uh, article recently by Martin Wolf in the Financial Times with, with a great uh, advocacy for land value taxation. Um, that could raise huge amounts of revenue. Um, and would enable us to restructure the tax system in a very, to a very great degree. Um, economists generally agree it would also be a very good thing because it would, um, it, it's not uh, distortionary in any way. And, and I don't think that we don't introduce that because people are afraid that it will have a negative impact on economic growth. We don't introduce that because property owners have a huge political influence and they don't want it because they get huge rents from owning property. And it's precisely those huge rents which land value taxation would take away. So again, we come back to the political choices that we face about what we tax. And um, the taxation of, of income uh, undoubtedly means that um, uh, it, it militates against uh, against workers because they keep a lower proportion uh, of their of their pay uh, in their disposable income. Uh, similarly, with the offshore tax havens, I can see no conceivable reason for economic growth for allowing all these things to go on in the Cayman Islands and the Virgin Islands and everything like that. And, and I would think it, 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 we'd be much more likely to have a dynamic economy if we had far greater transparency in who owned what, and we did away with things like offshore tax havens so that people who have um, operations in particular countries actually have to pay the taxes in those countries. So I, the fact that we don't do these things doesn't seem to me to be a function of our desire for economic growth. We don't do these things because we can't articulate their desirability well enough politically in order to overcome the huge vested interests which uh, argue against them and which undoubtedly fund politicians against them. And the reason that the carbon tax has never really even been, been seriously considered in the United States is that the fossil fuel industry has bought most of the Republican politicians' 
and they vote against it. Well, that's, that's nothing to do with uh, a desire for economic growth or not. So I, I think, you know, we, we need, I think, to be a little more um, perceptive in, in what are the things that politicians are doing which are socially or environmentally damaging because they want growth. And then I would be as critical as anyone else of those things. And what it is that they are doing or not doing um, simply because of ideolo ideology or subservience to vested interests. And that's a very different thing, which wouldn't require us to rethink growth, but would obviously require us to become um, uh, more effective politically, if you like. So that's my contribution at this stage. Great, thank you, Paul. I must admit, I didn't expect to see Georgism make an appearance in this talk, but there you go. So, Tim, absolutely. Well, if Martin, if Martin Wolf can do it, so can I. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> Tim. Your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with that on the wealth tax. I cannot. What I can't understand politically is why a Labour Party would not support a wealth tax. That makes no sense to me at all. Except, of course, if the Labour Party itself has been somehow also corrupted by those same forces that Paul's talking about, or is trying to prove to all the people that they think matters, that they have to show their credentials as being equally corrupt as the government in power. But it is, you know, it's, it, is, it is clear to me, to answer your question, Liam, that those kinds of financial incentives, those kinds of financial mechanisms are important in changing behaviours, in changing investment structures, in allowing for government spend to spend in a different way and giving more flexibility in monetary policy, giving more flexibility in fiscal policy, allowing government to, to play its role in as a, as the sovereign defender of the rights to human well-being in the nation. And, and that does draw also, I think, on, on what Caroline was talking about, its ability to spend into the economy in defense of that right. And taxation actually in that view, in Stephanie Kelton's view and the modern money theory view of it, taxation is a way of controlling inflation. And of course you want to use whatever taxes that you can to control that inflation at the point at which you need to control that inflation. And wealth tax is a long, long pedigree in being one of those mechanisms. I would just also point to you know, the second part of your, do, do we need financial incentives or is it deeper question, Liam? Because it's to me, it is also deep. Deeper. And that, that's the insight stems a little bit from that piece of work that I was describing about Piketty. Piketty's answer to the decline um, in growth rates and the rise in inequality was to propose a wealth tax of some kind. We modeled that wealth tax in our model. And the trouble is you have to just keep rising, raising and raising and raising that wealth tax because the underlying basis for inequality, which is the distribution of ownership of assets, as well as the distribution of ownership of, of distribution of income, um, has not been tackled. And the forces that generate that in capitalism are actually at the heart of the idea that the capitalist economy is in pursuit of productivity and that productivity is measured in a very particular way as the returns on investments measured as a fraction of the uh, investment capital and or and or as the monetary output per unit of of input of some kind or another they amount to the basically the same thing and what they tend to do is to chase work out of the economy. And in chasing work out of the economy, you reduce the livelihoods of the poorest in society, you create more social welfare costs, and so you have a higher tax need by government in order to rectify those faults. So that's the sense, I think, in which that deeper structural um, question that you were asking, do we have to change things more fundamentally, um, comes to bite? Yes, I think the answer is that we do under current structures and in particular under current distributions of ownership of assets and rights to incomes. That the, the, the financial mechanisms that you can engage in, taxes, subsidies, wealth taxes, um, where, wherever you go, carbon taxes, they tend to not just face the political opposition that Paul was talking about, they tend to be about chasing our tails in a system that is driving towards ever increasing inequality because of its obsession with a productivity growth that will give us back 
growth. And that's the sense in which we need to abandon that growth-based model. We need to re-question productivity. We have to talk about social value, which is delivered not in terms of monetary output per unit of time input, but actually in well-being per time input or some metric along those lines. And that gives us not just a different way of structuring the economy, it gives us a rationale, a social rationale, a narrative, which says that nurses, for example, are worth their place in society. It takes us back to applauding on the doorsteps during the pandemic, instead of castigating them for going on strike for decent working conditions, because we've put labor and the labor in particular of care back at the heart of society as a fundamental investment we can't do that if our only metrics are monetary metrics, and we can't achieve it if our own only policy instruments are financial policy instruments. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. And so, Caroline, your thoughts on this topic? Uh, following Tim is is not easy. That was that was a very um uh, a very eloquent and uh, yeah a very rigorous answer with which uh, obviously I I agree. I mean the the idea that of, of course we we want prices that tell the ecological truth. So we do need to internalize external costs. Market mechanisms are important in playing a role in doing that. But on their own, they're not going to be enough. And I I, I think um, some of those social and cultural um, framings that, that Molly was talking about are, are, are important with that. I mean, we haven't talked about things like, you know, the role of the advertising industry, for example, which is which is driving so much of the of, of the growth and persuading us to go out and spend money we don't have in Tim's wonderful uh, quote from Prosperity Without Without Growth. Um, what is it, Tim? People persuading people to spend money they don't have on things they don't need to make impressions that don't last on on people they don't care about it was a beautiful thing that you said but anyway it just sums it up and, and the advertising industry driving that so i think we have to be quite careful when we're thinking about all of these other things that we want to try to use regulation to achieve the context in which that's happening is one for example right now where there is such a massive push on 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 advertising and, and so much money in that one of the things, uh, sort of a campaign that we've we've just been starting in Parliament just now, is would be to try to um, to have a prohibition on 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 banning high carbon um, products. And you can spend a lot of time deciding what a high carbon product is, but for the sake of argument, you could put flights in there. Um, uh, you could put you could put oil and gas companies and and, and so forth, and and come up with a, a definition. We're working with a with a, a legal chambers right now on, on on what a definition of that might might look like, I suppose I was just going to come back very quickly uh, since um, Paul put, put down his provocation back. And of course, I'm not arguing that everything the government doesn't do, they don't do because because it might affect growth. But I think Molly's example of of choosing electric vehicles rather than public transport is not unrelated to the growth impacts of of simply changing the the the, the output of your of your vehicle factory. And I think if we just think about where public pressure comes from at the moment, as long as people are fed the uh, illusion that that, you know, greater growth for 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 well, the greater GDP growth is somehow going to benefit everybody equally. And that if they just hang on in there, then they might just get a few crumbs from the table. The idea that that isn't sufficiently challenged, I think you could make an argument probably does neutralize some of the um, mobilization which there might otherwise be around the importance of redistribution for as long as people think that 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 uh, that, that growth is going to be the way that they that they themselves get richer even though we know uh, that, that the vast bulk of, of of growth goes to those who are already well off but nonetheless I think you could argue that that actually holds back some of the some of the movements in the streets we might otherwise see for redistribution and indeed for a wealth tax. So I, I just find it quite extraordinary in one sense that, that, that there isn't a far greater um, public outcry uh, when you look at the levels of wealth of some people that, that, that just doesn't get factored in to any of the kind of economic uh, analysis that, that the Chancellor will do when it comes to his budget. Great. Thank you very much, Caroline. So we're going to cover one. You more haven't topic. given me a chance to answer this. Oh, one, sorry. William. Sorry, I got the order. Don't worry. Wrong. Oh, it's God. a different order, so it's confusing. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously, we're living in a market economy, for better or worse. And uh, 
in many ways it is for better, I wouldn't challenge that. Therefore, regulation and incentives and signaling to markets are really important. And a lot of the work I did as an MEP in the Department of Sustainable Finance was precisely about that. And now I'm back as an academic, I'm investigating how the market has sort of bastardized what we tried to achieve, which is actually quite intriguing. But nonetheless, there was some important signaling going on there. But I, I mean, I think what I find difficult working with other economists is what I would call economism, which is this idea that if if some, you know, the idea that there might be a missing market because something's not being bought and sold, you know, maybe there's a missing market when I look after my grandson, because if we only, you know, if we were real good market people, we would be buying and selling something, or I'd be charging my son, you know. And the idea that that when there's a disaster, it must be a market failure. No, there's all sorts of ways of interpreting that, but everything is always interpreted in terms of the market. And I think that's part of the, the conceptual problem that we're, we're tackling here. But having said that, obviously, I, I mean, I was a huge supporter of the carbon tax. I bribed people in the Green Party to the bottle of wine if they'd go on the radio and say carbon tax. It worked quite well, actually. We had that discussed quite a lot around the time of COP. She's not joking. And it's the single, <laughs> I think you got a bottle, Caroline. It's the single most important lever to to you know, put a proper price on carbon and shift the way the economy is working, but it's just not enough and it's not fast enough. So I'm afraid, even speaking from the Green Party here, I'm a serious headbanger on just say no, we're gonna to have to stop people doing things. Market incentives are not gonna happen fast enough. And also the, the other problem with market incentives is rich people can get around them. So yes, of course I support a frequent flyer levy, but wealthy people will just pay that and carry on flying or even have a private jet. So you know, we're going to have to talk about rationing, we're going to have to talk about actually stopping people doing things, we're going to have to ban the sale of SUVs, first day in government for a green government. We're actually seeing a situation now where the, the emissions from SUVs are offsetting all the saving in emissions from people who are switching to electric vehicles. So why are we allowing SUVs to be sold so people are driving tanks? Insight from my grandson here, when we're walking around, he'll say car, car, then he sees one of those things and he says tractor, you know, he ought to say he ought to say tank, but he doesn't know that word yet. I'll have to teach him that, but they're not cars. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly going off on one here, but because I think market incentives and market signaling is not enough. We're gonna to have to actively stop people from doing things. And I totally agree about the high carbon ads, but I would also point to what happened this winter where people had to use a lot less energy. And what I observed was, it was partly about price. I think it was partly about, also about solidarity with Ukraine, but what people did was they were extremely resourceful in finding ways to lose, use less energy. And energy demand has declined. And I think we need to, we need to actually, there we are. Yeah, I'm sitting under a duvet, exactly. You know, we have to expect better of I people. want to see to Paul's gloves. In... <laughs> Where are your gloves, Paul? We have to frame this in terms of existential <laughs> crisis. And, uh, you know, and then people will respond accordingly. We ought to expect better of people. And part of what I don't like about the, the market model is that it expects that people are just greedy and driven by money. And that's, we can see from COVID, we can see from the energy crisis, that's not the case. Okay, great. Thank you, Molly. And so I want to jump to one topic before we end. So we're running up to the hard limit fairly quickly, but I think I'm going to end on a bit of a bigger topic. So thinking about this from a global perspective. So Michael Shaw brought this up in the Q&A. Uh, and so I add a little twist on this is in this global perspective, we have approximately 8% of the global population living in extreme poverty, right? So this is subsisting on less than $2.15 a day. How do we achieve degrowth or no growth in a way that does not leave people behind? So how can we reconcile some of the challenges of global inequalities and global poverty within different paradigms? Of course, Tim, I was going to say you should be first, and then we'll go to the same order again. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, I think I, it's good that you, you asked that question, because I think it's always important to preface who we're talking about in relation to limits to growth. Um, of course, at the planetary level, there are limits to resource growth. Um, and that, I think, if you talk about fairness and you put inequality at the heart of a post-growth policy, which you absolutely have to, then you have to talk about a fair share of those resources across the planet. And actually, when you look at the data in relation to economic growth and the relationship between key prosperity indicators, key indicators of human well-being measured against per capita income growth, what you find is that in the poorest countries in the world, those indicators improve massively 
as you improve incomes from next to nothing to around about ten, fifteen thousand dollars per capita. In other words, there is not a case from a well-being point of view or from a fairness point of view for imposing degrowth on the poorest countries in the world. It is rather a responsibility of the advanced economies. And if you look at again at the data, what you find is beyond that $10,000, $15,000 point, the return to your increased income growth begins to diminish rapidly and sometimes go into negative terrain. So you know, longevity, for example, rises from about 50 years to 85 years during, over that first period from nothing to ten to $15,000 per capita. And then it remains pretty much stable. And sometimes in some countries like the US and the UK even, you have lower life expectancy than you do in some countries on a fraction of the income. So that's, you know, that's actually, it's really important to make that point. It's really important to make that the point that punishing the poorest people in the world for the economic model of the richest people in the world is not a viable way forward in any scenario whatsoever. And then you get a sort of subsidiary question, which is, well, what would happen if the rich countries decided to degrow? And what would that do to trade? Because the poor, poor countries, they'd never be able to recover from that. And that, as far as, as far as, as far as the kind of conventional wisdom is concerned, that's supposed to be a showstopper. But actually, increasingly, as you look at the evidence, as you look at the mechanisms between North and South, you begin to find, actually, that the South is much more interdependent in relation to its growth patterns. It doesn't necessarily require, in the way that it did in the past, the markets of the North. And that argument turns out to be largely a fig leaf to stop any discussion of degrowth, even in the rich countries. We actually have another piece of work that's being carried carried out in CUSP at the moment, which is modeling that interaction between a, a degrowing or stabilizing north and what happens in the south. And it isn't easy to figure it out. But on the other hand, what is clear is that there are a number of policy mechanisms that you could use to mitigate any adverse effect of reduced growth in the northern economies on what's happening in the south, not the least of which is a transfer of resources in recompense for all the resources that have gone the other way in the past to really support development and low carbon development and the transition to net zero in the poorest countries in the world. That's a really important part of an equation. And we have to do it again, irrespective of whether we have growth in the North countries or not. Excellent, Tim. So Caroline, your thoughts on this and then Molly, you'll be next. Yeah, I'm very mindful we've got three minutes left. So um, I will only simply say that um, I, I think the arguments that, uh, that that Tim has just put forward just demonstrate why justice has to be at the heart, international justice, global justice needs to be at the heart of the of the environmental movement, of the climate movement, and, and indeed it is. Um, and when it comes to climate, for example, there have been sort of models and, and, and architecture demonstrating how you would enable poorer countries still to be able to, to grow to the extent that they need to answer needs rather than greed. And that there was a, a, a model called contraction and convergence, which would showed over time how the richer countries would, would contract their, their environmental footprint, if you like, to enable uh, some of the poorer countries to, to grow, but hopefully also obviously leapfrogging over some of the most damaging technologies in, in, in the process. Um, but I think it's an argument that, that just doesn't get um, enough attention paid to it. Again, I come back to government. I, I mean, the idea that, that globally we have a target of net zero by 2050, the number of times I try to explain to the UK government and ministers that actually that means like a country like the UK that is overwhelmingly responsible for global emissions needs to go further and faster, um, it, it falls on deaf ears. You know, there is this sense that, that everyone is going to be tied into that same um, that same target without actually looking at the capabilities of different countries to make that shift and the responsibilities. And if we built in those two things, then we would have a situation where indeed the richer countries were, were, were going much further, much faster and paying their fair share. And, and we're a long way from that at the moment, unfortunately. And Molly, your thoughts? I'm really glad this question was asked as well, because, you know, climate justice doesn't mean anything if it doesn't mean that we establish what is a decent standard for everybody on Earth. And we don't have some kind of special pleading just because we've taken an unfair share of resources in these countries of the West over several decades now. 
But I think it's also an important point Caroline made that countries that haven't gone through this heavy industrial, heavy energy intensive process of development actually can make much greater advances, for example, in the uh, production of renewable energy. So, you know, Costa Rica already 100 percent renewable, lots of African countries catching up there. And something we can do with our wealth and by way of reparations is to share that technology and invest in those energy um, and like we've seen with the Just Energy Partnerships with South Africa and Indonesia, which have been agreed in the past couple of COPs, for example. I know we're getting to the end now, but I just wanted to mention as well the Easterlin paradox, because we haven't talked very much about the environment here, which is quite surprising since we're all greens. Perhaps we take that as red. But we also haven't talked... Um, we also haven't talked very much about other issues that I think really matter, like happiness, which I see somebody raised in the questions. And I just want to mention the Easterlin paradox. It's only to economists that the fact that being richer doesn't make you happier is a paradox. You know, it's that even well-known philosophers like the Beatles knew that was an obvious truth. But essentially, you can reach happiness with a fairly low level of material material wealth and that's what we should be aiming to do and I just want to return to the point Tim made at the beginning is we should start there what is it makes us happy what is it enables us to live comfortably within the limits of the planet on an equal basis on a global basis and then maybe we will generate growth we probably would as we go through the green transition but that wouldn't be what we were trying to do we'd actually have our objectives first and then growth would be a secondary consideration and that's the direction I think we should move in. Excellent, Molly. And then finally, Paul, your thoughts on the question? Well, I've nothing much to add, really. Um, I think we've got consensus, more or less, on this point. I mean, it's clearly important that the lowest income countries do experience economic growth. And it's clearly important that uh, richer countries help them do it in their own self-interest, apart from anything else. So they need to give health and education support. They need to stop benefiting from unfair trade, especially minerals trade. Minerals are going to be incredibly important for low carbon technologies, and we've got to start paying a proper price for them. Um, and they need to enable low carbon development, as Molly said, in those countries, because uh, if, if we don't help low carbon development in those countries, then uh, if they're offered high carbon development, they'll take it. And there's no shortage of people who are offering them high carbon development. So um, uh, that's, that's the choice. Great. So we managed to run 92 minutes in the end. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things we could have discussed. This conversation could go on for 92 hours, 92 days, maybe even 92 years if we wanted to. But this has been a great event. And I hope everyone has really got something out of this and some new thoughts and new perspectives on this important issue. Um, I want to wish you all a good night, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world and take care, everyone.